Yep, starting now. Um, I think, Karen, do, do you wanna do you wanna start to share your screen just so we can yes look at something? <laughs> Not my face. <laughs> All right, let me just get this started. Have oh. a bunch of extra windows everywhere. There we go. Ta-da! Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so today we're going to talk about our forest health monitoring. That's a program that is happening um, in Olympic Shire since 2017. Um, before starting, I just want to um, acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land where we are today and where we work, um, the, the Wurundjeri Wurrung people, and pay my respects to the elders past, present, um, and future. Uh, I have here with me Karen Rowe. Um, Karen, um, Karen is the coordinator, was the coordinator of forest health monitoring from 2019 to 2021, but she, she was involved in the project since 2017, since the, the beginning of the project. Uh, now she works at the Melbourne Museum uh, in a range of very cool uh, projects that use sound data. Um, and today she will start to present about the background and early years uh, of the project. And then I will follow her. Um, my name is Ellie. And I work as an environmental projects officer in the Lumbay Council. I've been involved with the project since 2020. And since last year, uh, I've been working as the coordinator uh, of the project uh, at the Lumbay Council. And I'll share some of her findings and how can you get involved and uh, more recent things of the project. Um, so without further ado, Karen, <laughs> you start. <laughs> yes, thanks, Ellie. Hi, everyone. Um, as Ellie introduced me, I'm Karen Rowe. I'm actually currently the curator of birds at the Melbourne Museum or Museums Victoria. Um, and I'm really uh, excited to sort of give you a background um, in the history of the Forest Health Monitoring Project, which is in its seventh year already. I'm not sure if we have any of the landholders here tonight, but if we do, thank you very much for letting us participate uh, and do this project, because it is really um, uh, sort of a, a leading um, community engagement project that I have not encountered anywhere else. And so I think it's a really great collaboration among um, state government, uh, local councils and landholders. Um, and it, it's a really exciting thing to be a part of. Um, so I really just want to give you um, first give you a background of where the project came from um, and how we collect the data, how we've come to the forest health monitoring project um, and what we're assessing. Um, and Ellie will give you a really um, up-to-date background or uh, up-to-date uh, results that's been happening since I left the project many years ago. So um, really started by a few landholders within the land care network, the Nilimbic Land Care Network, that were really keen to um, understand better how healthy Nilimbic's forests are. Now, I live in Nilimbic myself, so it's really exciting to have a project about uh, the local area that we live in um, and the amazing forest assets that we have in this shire. Um, and so they're really, they were really keen on um, developing a partnership and getting funding to collect data, uh, sort of non-invasive data on uh, the wildlife um, and plants that are in Nilimbic and kind of keeping track of that over time and, and are, are our forests doing better or worse. Um, but we really didn't have a framework for doing that. And so really a lot of the project was setting up how do we measure forest health? And who are the people that we need to involve in that project to assess that? And so this was a really very large collaboration of people from the Land Care Network, from Museums Victoria, that's where I was coming in. Um, we had early help from the Victoria National Parks Association, um, this council itself, uh, Parks Victoria, some of the places where we survey are within Parks Victoria, but a large majority of the land in Nilimbic Shire is private. And so it was really, really important to have uh, private landholders as part of this project. So the project started out really, really uh, slim in terms of funding. Uh, we had a little bit of money in 2017 to do a pilot project and demonstrate the framework that we were looking at. Um, and then in 2018, we were supported by the Helen McPherson Smith Trust for a three-year project. And since then, um, Nilambic Shire Council themselves have been collecting data um, and having, you know, basically Ellie's been able to analyze the data as time permits. Um, so it's a... a a low cost but data rich project that is really helping um, 
feed into a better understanding of uh, Nilambic Shire's wildlife and um, forest assets, um, and also feeding into the biodiversity strategy, strategy that's being developed. So really, the the project was focused on not just you know what hap what animals occur in our forests, but it, a really statistically robust way of assessing. Um, what animals occur where, um, allowing us to infer more broadly across the Shire. Um, and so two of the main forest assets within Nilambic Shire are the wet and dry forests. And so it was really trying to develop a, a robust way of sampling those different habitats to get information about what species are present there. And so it was a really community rich project as well. And so we've engaged community from day one in terms of how we collect the data. Um, we have events like uh, bird trivia day. So that picture up on the top is one of the very early bird days we had where we played different sounds of birds and we had our community members help us identify them. And that really fed into um, some of the results that Ellie will talk about how we build an understanding of the species as well as the sounds they make so we can actually survey them better. Um, so they helped us with identifying the bird calls. We also had a framework where we identified indicator species, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but really the aim was to find out what are measurable goals that we could develop to evaluate forest health. So what does it mean to have a healthy forest? And so that's really the first question that we were asking is, okay, how do we build a framework within a community uh, to be able to measure forest health? And so I'll, I'll, I'll take you through each of these different steps. Uh, this is the framework that we, we came up with. We decided, okay, we're gonna develop what are the criteria for the healthy forest. Then we designed how we would collect the data. Um, and then two of the ways that we use that data is to identify indicator species. Um, we have a second way of evaluating the biodiversity within a site based on a soundscape. And I'll talk to you a bit more about that as well. Um, and then that helps us with the assessment itself. So first let's start with the criteria. So for us, healthy forests are um, different, many different species of plants and animals, many different age classes, um, big areas, connected areas, and areas that experience infrequent disturbance. So disturbance can mean not just fire, uh, but it can also be drought. We've experienced both of those um, in the last 20 years. Um, and so the interesting thing about Nilambic though, is that because we have two main forest assets, wet and damp forest and dry forest and woodlands, we actually have two different ways of assessing what are healthy forests in each of those. So what may be a healthy forest in a dry forest may not be the same that's what healthy in a wet and damp forest. And so we really wanted to have two separate sets of criteria to better understand the diversity of habitats within Nilambic. So, the next thing was, well, it's it's all great to say that we have established that. How do we measure that? How do we measure how the quality of the habitats? How do we measure um, what species are present um, and how those species change over time? And that's where the data collection part came in. And so really what we decided was across the entire Shire, we could survey about 30 sites in a year because we're really focused on the time when animals are most uh, detectable. And I'll get into that a little bit later too. Um, and we went to Arthur Riley Institute and say, please develop a, a sort of statistically robust uh, sampling plan across the Shire. And so this really involved uh, surveying sites in both public land and private land, because we know that private land is a really, really important uh, way to protect habitat. Um, and it's becoming more and more important the more we uh, are facing climate change um, across the globe, really. So we took a, an approach called stratified random sampling, where we just divided the Shire up into different components. So we have like, I think it's about six different regions. And then within each of those regions, we just identified five sites. And we really wanted to match the number of sites surveyed with the proportions of different types of forests within the Shire. And so we know that West Forest is actually a smaller portion of the forest within Nilambic, about 7,200 hectares. 4,900 hectares of that is in private land. So you see the importance of private land in protecting that forest assets within Nilambic. Um, a lot more dry forest occurs within Nilambic. So we actually um, split the number of sites between uh, wet and dry roughly in proportion to what they occur. So twice as many dry forest sites as there are wet forest sites to get a better handle on the diversity um, and the extent of each of those forest types within Nilambic. And so here are actually two pictures of forest types within uh, Nilambic. So here on the top is a wet forest example. As you can see, there's a lot of um, 
a, a dense growth of understory and lots of bracken in a lot of places. Um, and we also have a dry forest. So the picture on the bottom is actually from Plenty Gorge Parklands. Um, and some of these sites have had recent fires, some haven't, but you can see that there's very different um, aspects of each of these forest types. Oops. All right, so where are the sites found? Um, so this is just a, a map of Nilambic and all of the tanny yellow color, of the dry forests, um, and all of the yellow dots are actually the survey sites for dry forest and all of the foresty green colors and the bright green dots, those are the distribution of the sites for wet forest. And so you can see we really have strong sampling in certain areas. There are some that are um, in Bend of Islands, there's some in um, King Lake, two different sections of King Lake. So we really wanted to capture um, a breadth of sites across the Shire, um, but it was a little bit dictated by access and landholders who were really interested in um, participating in the project. And we had quite a few very enthusiastic landholders, which is really great um, to really be able to work with the local community groups um, and local community members uh, on this project. It was very keen. We've had actually a lot of them come out with us to set the recorders out. And so that's always fun. Um, so then uh, how do we collect the data? So we're really interested in what birds and mammals occur within the Shire, because those are the ones that are easy to identify and um, easy, and most people are really interested in them. Um, and that's where we have the most expertise. So we use two different type of passive monitoring um, equipment. Um, what you see on the left there is what we call a song meter. That's actually a recorder. So those two little black um, uh, like sort of nubs on the side are the microphones. And then the box itself is uh, sort of a mini computer um, that records the audio data um, in the environment. So it'll record for two minutes every 30 minutes. And then it, it provides a sort of a, um, a two week long snapshot of what animals are making sounds in that environment during that time frame. Now we also take mostly to target mammals, but it also picks up some birds and some herps. So reptiles um, in the environment are these motion sensing cameras. So a camera is attached to a tree and it's triggered by heat uh, and movement um, whenever an animal moves the cross in front of it. And so on the right side, you see that bait station that's got some really stinky, smelly um, peanut butter and oats and fish oil uh, all together in sort of a, a like a, a pellet, um, and then those go inside of tea strainers, and then the little box around it um, keeps them from being eaten right away. Um, but what happens is you'll get, uh, Ellie will show you some fantastic uh, images that have been collected by um, the cameras, but the animals will go up and they'll sniff it and they'll try to get into that. And that's how we can trigger the cameras to record what animals are present. So it's all passive monitoring. Um, and we primarily survey during the spring and summer depending on what the conditions are. We've had a little bit of late summer in some cases because of COVID or other reasons, um, but generally we try to target the time period when uh, the animals are most active. So for birds, it's mostly the breeding season, so spring and summer, um, a little bit more summer than we'd like, but it is what it is. Um, and then we generally leave them out for about two weeks uh, and then we'll rotate to another set of sites. So it takes about all summer to get to those 30 sites. All right, so here's an example. you will see a lot more images um, in Ellie's part of the presentation, but you can see the cameras help us uh, identify the presence of different species. So we started using logs uh, across the um, space between the camera and the bait station, and it allows us to see some of the smaller things we may not normally see. Um, but here is a, a picture of a tree dragon that we recorded um, in Warren at King Lake Nature Conservation Reserve, which is really exciting. So this is what the data looks like when it comes back to us. For the audio data, it's a little bit different and a lot harder to analyze, but this is what audio data looks like. It sounds kind of weird to say, what does a sound look like? But what we do um, with audio data, and this is really where my expertise came into the project, um, is when we record the audio data, we can actually visualize it as what we call a spectrogram. And that is basically just um, a map of the different frequencies of the call. So low frequency calls are really, really low and then high frequencies are high. Um, if anyone's familiar with music, it's a lot easier to understand. Um, 
but basically you create a like a signature of the sounds in that environment. So here is the the program that we use um, to analyze and uh, store the audio data is called Arbimon, and here's an example of a spectrogram on the left, and then a zoomed in one there. But what I just wanted to take uh, a little bit of time and play you uh, this recording. So this recording was made at site one. W2 on January 5th, 2021 at 8 a.m. So it's just about um, after dawn chorus, um, but you'll get to hear a little bit of the different calls and then you can identify. So that's a minute. That's one of the two minutes that we would have recorded at 8 a.m. Um, and each of these darker smears is basically uh, the signature of that bird calling. And so there are a lot of different species calling in there, great fantails, a couple different lorikeets. Um, and so really what we're interested in doing is recording the sounds of those, but then we actually have ways of analyzing those sounds um, that will get in. Ah, and it'll do it again. There we go. So. Uh, once we that's the way we've collected the data now what we need to do is figure out how the we can use the data that we've collected to identify whether our species are, are or whether those species are associated with healthy forests or not healthy forests and this is where we come up with the idea um, of an indicator species so in this case what we mean by an indicator species is a particular species that's associated with positive value to that forest type so in this case we would say just a very general um, idea would be if a particular species is associated with a healthy forest, um, then we would say that could be a good indicator species. But we also have to be able to reliably tell whether that species is present. So the only indicator species we could really use in this project were ones that would be detected by the cameras or one that we could record with the audio and that we could easily identify it in that audio. So something like, um, uh, brush-tailed fascagale, there's lots of those in the Shire. Those are great indicator species because they're associated with uh, healthy forests, but they also show up on our cameras. So this is how we came up with a framework for the indicator species um, based on the way that we collected data and whether or not it would help us understand better how our forests are doing. And so how do we come up with the indicator species? Well, this, this was an interesting part of the project because we decided because it's a, a community driven question, we really wanted the community to have input on what species they wanted to have as part of the indicator species list. And so we held a workshop way back in 2020 um, where we invited community members to come and contribute their ecological knowledge about the forests within the Olympic and they helped us decide which were those indicator species and we also had a couple of online questionnaires and so we have an amazing amount of natural history knowledge within the Olympic. And we really wanted to tap into that and we had a really good outcome for that and Ellie will talk to a bit more about which species were selected um, and why those um, uh, have been really useful for us to tell how well our forests are doing. Now some species are associated with one habitat so one some species are only found in wet habitats some are only found in dry and some are found in both um, and actually we really had a long list that we said we would be able to identify but because of constraints to with to you know the time we had available. Um, we really started with a small list of species and then we're sort of slowly building it over the years um, as the methods for identifying those species get better. And this is to do with mostly with the call recognizer stuff that um, we'll get into. And so one of the questions you might ask is, well, that's great that we have all these audio recordings, but how do you know what species are in there in an efficient way? Well, one way we've had um, really great uh, 
contributions from our uh, community members to help us identify those calls by listening to them and telling us what species are in those recordings. But we also have methods where we can use a computer to help us create sort of a template or a model of an individual species uh, call, and then we can use that to scan all our audio data. And so these are where we build what we call recognizers or classifiers. Um, and each, so each one of the boxes across the top is a, an example of what a yellow face honey eater would look like on a spectrogram. And then we put all those into a big model, a computer model, and then it tells us where are the similar sounding calls within our audio data. And that's how we can speed up the process of identifying <coughs> our indicator species are in our audio data. And so what that's so that identifying whether the indicator species are present is one of the components of how we can assess whether our forests are healthy, but another one is actually a more general way of identifying how diverse a particular habitat is. So in this case, we actually can listen to the soundscape and that clip I played you was a lot of different species. So in an environment where you have lots of different species, you generally assume that that, um, that habitat supports greater biodiversity and then that therefore that habitat is healthier. And so what we can do is we can actually use those same um, audio files and compute a metric called an acoustic index. And so what does that look like? That really just looks like um, well, as I said, is a measure, uh, a measuring of the overall biodiversity, but here's what it would look like. So those same spectrograms that you saw um, when I played the clip, uh, each one of those smears is uh, what would be associated with an individual species. So what I've highlighted here in red is the sound of one species making their sound, and then in orange is another species making a sound, and then in blue is a third species. And so in that case, there are really only three species making sounds in that soundscape. But if you compare that to the one below it, you can see there are a lot more species in there. So in this case, we would consider um, the environment in which this soundscape was produced to be much more species rich or much more diverse than the one on the top. And so we can actually calculate this mathematically and it gives us an indicator of more or less species rich. And so Ellie will talk a little bit more about the results from that. And so that's a second independent way that we can actually evaluate how healthy our forests are. Um, and so all of that information goes into what we would consider that forest health assessment. And so now I've sort of given you a context and the background on the project. And I think, as yes, I'll hand it over to Ellie um, to sort of run through the results that we found over the time that the project's been running. Um, and then uh, I guess we'll open up to questions after Ellie's done. So Ellie, I'm gonna stop sharing and then she should be able to take yeah. over. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, yeah, I think we're gonna have some time after the after my presentation, so you can have some some questions, can have a chat. Um, I'll start to share my screen and find my screen. Oops. Um, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Oh, um, so, so yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the results that we, that we got, uh, in the, in the last, not seven years, so we are in this near seventh year project. Uh, I, we do have the results for the last six years and we start to, uh, to collect the results for the, for the 20, for 2023 now. Um, so I'm going to talk a, a bit, a bit of general results for the cameras, from soundscapes, and also how we're framing this into uh, this indicator species um, idea, and how can you help as well, if you want. <laughs> so as as Carrie was saying, like the way we're framing the project is using those indicator species. Um, so the project that has this initial stage, where along with community members, this list um, was identified, uh, and part of our indicator species are detected with motion sense cameras, and other part with the audio recorders. And on top of that, we are also using those uh, acoustic indices to measure this uh, activity uh, in our recordings as well. Um, so I'm just going to start. Uh, talking a little bit about the results that we got in our cameras. Um, 
In, so we usually we get more than 10,000 uh, images to identify every year. Uh, so in all those six years of projects that I'm going to present here, there were more than 70,000 images um, identified. And this is uh, just an, an example of uh, what do we get uh, in our cameras. This is a good example. Those are easy to identify. Those, the, those are the ones that we can see. Uh, so every time that a camera is triggered, it takes 10 pictures. So we have those 10 images to try to identify whatever triggers uh, the camera. And, um, and, we can, and we can see here that we get uh, a whole uh, heap of different uh, species. Um, They're very curious. Uh, so as Karen was saying, like uh, birds are not exactly the focus of our, uh, of our cameras here, but uh, we do get birds in, in, in the cameras and we can see uh, the lyre birds uh, here is the only one that we are using uh, the detection from from the cameras uh, to actually um, uh, to actually use use uh, this this information, uh, and we also get a whole heap of uh, invasive species. So everything that it's happening uh, in in the council really from rabbits, uh, deers, uh, foxes, and um, and cats uh, as well. So until last year, identifying all those images was responsibility of, um, of the council officers of, or whoever was responsible for the project or just some very few volunteers who needed access to all the files and have all the files in their computers. Uh, but this year, we're starting to use a more volunteer-friendly platform. So all the pictures from 2023 are now in this uh, website that's called Zooniverse. Uh, and anyone can access uh, this. You don't even you don't even need a login. You just need to have um, the link to the project. So anyone can access this and try to identify the image. And this is sort of what it looks like. So whenever you open the website, you're gonna see like those those the sequence this the of this ten pictures taken um, for, uh, at once uh, from the camera, and then you can then you can have a goal like you can try to see uh, of this list of the most common species uh, if you find uh, the one that you think it is uh, in the photo or you can even just um, just type it if, if, if it's not in the list or if you think it's something else you just you can just type it uh, so this is uh, in the next few months we're going to start to to review um, re review this information from from the website and to collate everything and then we're going to see like how well, this is how, how this is, is working, but uh, so far it's pretty exciting that we got uh, a lot of people involved uh, in identifying the images and looking at the website. So from 2017 to 2022, um, we detected 55 species in our image. This is the, this big list of everything that we detected. Um, so, as I say, like we have detected 31 very curious birds here, but this is not our main match method of detection uh, for, for to, just to detect birds, really. Um, the lyre bird is the only one that we are considering here, because detecting them on the recording can be very, very tricky. Uh, so from this list, like we can only see three uh, species that we're considering considered, uh, indicator species. Those are the lyre birds, um, the brushte fasco gales, and the donuts. Um, we are still considering the donuts, even knowing that detectability of them, it's very, it's detectability is very low, and we have detected just a few times during uh, our monitoring efforts. It's, but when we look at our audio data, as Karen was saying, like it's a bit more complex uh, to analyze. Uh, so we have um, we have some very different uh, challenges with that. Uh, so, so far we have more than 200,000 minutes recorded, uh, which gives you an idea of how impossible it would have been to just listen to everything and how much information is stored in this data as well. Uh, so starting with this list of indicator species, uh, we are using this acoustic recognizers to process all this data. Um, so uh, in the name of this of this algorithm is pattern matching. Uh, so what the pattern matching does is to detect the patterns that are similar to the sample that we're providing. Uh, so this is what the screen of our analysis tool looks like. This is everything, it's online, so everyone can have access to this as well. Um, we have the sample, the sample on the top left, and all the possible matches are at the bottom. Uh, I'm just going to play this one. This is a white throat nightjar. Uh, 
Uh, so in this website, you can you can play all the clips, but you can also just look at them. Uh, in this case, this is this is like a very good case of just how how well those the, the spectrograms um, works for uh, in the, in this in for this type of analysis because you can actually just look at the spectrogram, and uh, in most cases you're gonna be able to tell if. Um, if that is a white throw night chair or not, without even having to to listen to to the recording. In all those years, we have amazing volunteers who are helping with this part of the process. Uh, and our, we have our last workshop focusing only on acoustic analysis was in February. And from now on, we want this to be a, a regular thing, like to have regular events events uh, around twice uh, a year. Uh, and because most of our indicator species are detected through all the recordings, uh, this is where most of our efforts in, in, anal in analyzing the data goes. Uh, so in depending on the type of the call and how sensitive you want our detectors to be, uh, we get a lot of results to validate, to say yes or no. Uh, so for each species, we can get anything from 400 to 2,000 results every year. from all this information. Uh, so we are focusing uh, on the indicator species. Um, and this is what our indicators list look like at the moment. Um, all the species we're chosen based on, F on habitats requirements, as Karen was saying, uh, they can indicate good environmental health in wet and or dry forests. Uh, we have all the results for 11 species. Those are the ones um, at, at the left. Um, so eight of them are detected by sounds and three of them are detected by images. Um, we still have a, a lot of species, a, lot, a long list to go through, and some of them are partially, partially analyzed. They're all, they're, they will be analyzed using the audio recordings. Um, and so, some of them are a bit, a bit trickier, um, but it's, it's, it's important to, to remember that the data is there. And so we can always go back uh, and we can always analyze things in a different way. Uh, so the information is, is there. And this is a snapshot of our indicator species uh, results. Uh, so we have here uh, the map of Nilumbik from 2017, 2022. Um, we can see from the size of the circles, they refer to the number of indicator species that were detected uh, in the color uh, to whether they were in private land, that's the red, the red circles, or public land, those are the yellow circles. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's, hard, it's hard when you just look at all of them, uh, but we, 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 what we can see is that, that first, like, we have sites within the King Lake National Park, they have like consistent, like good numbers. Uh, so which is which is expected because they are the largest protected area in the region. Uh, but they also serve like as a good comparison to understand how important the private areas are to conservation. So uh, we can see, for example, here, uh, the region, the, the, the Bend of Islands region is um, over here. I hope you can see my, my arrow. Uh, but the Bend of Islands region is, is an area that had like consistently good numbers of indicator species similar to, to the numbers that we find that, that we found in, at, at King Lake. Um, and here's important also to note that uh, those are not always the same species. Uh, so we have different different species that are important, that are, that are indicators of a healthy environment happening uh, in different parts of the Shire. And it is also interesting to look at the invasive species detected by your cameras. Um, here, the invasive species um, are this uh, faint um, blue circle. Uh, so here we are, we are comparing. We have one one map on top of one, we have uh, the two information on the same map. So we have the, the invasive species and, and the blue circle, and the indicator species are the red and yellow circles. And what we can yeah. What you can see in those three years of comparison. Oh, sorry, I think someone's not muted. <laughs> Oops. It's all right. Oops, keep going. Sorry. Um, so here we have 
three years of comparison, and we can see that we usually observe, we're usually going to see like more indicator species uh, in areas where we don't have as many invasive species present. Um, so the sites, again, like sites within parks uh, in yellow at, at, at the top, like the King Lake National Park are a good example. They have less detections of invasive species in general. Um, but again, uh, it's nice to see the Bend of Island region here, uh, more at, at the south. Um, they have consistently low low detection of invasive species, and that's a result of a big effort uh, to control pests over the years uh, in the area. Um, so because we have a lot of data to go through, we also explored uh, the acoustic indices to see uh, which information we could get from this uh, another type of, of analysis. Uh, this is still in early days, I would say, like there's there's a lot that can there's, there's, those two can do uh, with this data using acoustic indices, uh, but I'm just going, going to go through some of our results so far. Um, so an acoustic indices is basically a, a, a summary of all the acoustic information that we have in the recordings. So you translate, you're basically translating uh, one minute for record, one minute of recording into a number, just one number. Uh, there are dozens of different indices that we can use, and they have like different purpose. Uh, but and we tried a few of them, and we chose one to show today that seemed to represent better uh, what we are listening uh, in, in seeing our recordings. So just to give this uh, idea of how this index works, I think Karen showed something a bit similar, but um, in the, this image at the left, like we, we, we clearly have much, much more information, much more acoustic activity going on than um, in the image uh, at the right. This might mean that we have more species uh, or sometimes just that we have more, just more activity, just like the same a uh, few very loud species um, can also give some of uh, a similar result. Uh, first, we looked into just some basic um, information, such as the daily patterns of this index. Um, so we can see the daily variation here uh, in the graphs. Uh, there's a peak. Uh, so the arrows, the blue arrows here, they're indicating um, a peak uh, in the morning and another peak um, in, in the dusk, so and this is very reassuring for us, like it's meaning that all this index is capturing information about um, bird activity because that's a common bird pattern. So we see birds very active early in the morning and again active uh, late in, late in the afternoon. And another thing that to note here is uh, the blue line is are, are the wet sites and the, the, the wet forests and the, the red line um, are the dry forests. And we always get more activity uh, or more species uh, in, the dry, in, the, in the wet forests. And this was consistent, like every year it was the same, like we are always getting more uh, activity in the wet forests. Um, but then we decided to look into these results, into this, this index results, considering the first three years um, as a baseline information, because uh, things it, it, it takes some time for things to so so we can see like um, so some some changes uh, in in the environment. So uh, from there we assign uh, colors to to each site, um, and then we compare the colors among the years. So the red bars are the ones that have like the highest values of baseline information and the orange are intermediate and the yellow would have the lowest values. Uh, what we see we saw here was some consistency uh, in the areas that has like the lowest scores. Um, that means that, that th this can, in the areas that has like, the lowest scores, but not in the areas with the high or intermediate. Uh, so the areas that has lowest scores, low, lowest activity um, as a baseline information, uh, it, this this keep going on like in the next three years. So this could be related to the species richness in the areas, to how many species we have in the areas. Uh, but this could also mean, this could also be related to just like how active the species are uh, in, in that area. Uh, but one question was still there, like considering that, so this type of analysis is is quick, like it's very quick compared to uh, compared to, to other to other things that we can do with this data. Uh, but can we use the acute indices to predict the healthiest environments? Um, so in this case, like can we use that when we compare this to the indicator species? What do we see? 
Um, so we compare this, this same rank, ranking of number of indicator species with the acoustic indices. Um, and here you're using the same color code as before. Uh, but instead of seeing some consistency, uh, we see that areas that presented high values of acoustic indices, uh, they're not um, always, they're not the ones uh, that have more indicator species. So um, this probably means that we have some very noisy birds um, in, in areas that are not necessarily the, the areas that are considered the healthiest uh, one, um, according to indicator uh, species approach. And another thing that we explored was uh, how this was related to the vegetation condition. Uh, so every five years, we also have um, this quick vegetation assessment. Um, so we only have results for two years, for 2017 and 2022. Uh, and I'm going to show just the results considering the number of mature trees um, around the sampling side and also the tree canopy cover. Uh, so here on the left, we have the results for the acoustic indices and, and on the right uh, for the number of indicator species. Um, but what we see here, it's kind of having at least some mature trees in the area seem to be a factor that can explain both the acoustic activity, so the acoustic indices, uh, in, but also the presence of indicator species uh, in the area. And we saw kind of the same pattern uh, with the tree canopy class. So when we have like more canopy cover, we're gonna see more uh, species and more activity as well. Um, we covered a lot of uh, information here uh, in, in a very short time, uh, and there's much, much more uh, to explore. Um, but I'd just like to highlight uh, the importance of long-term projects to monitor uh, biodiversity. Uh, so everything in nature takes time to happen. And I feel like now we do have a good baseline of information, um, of biodiversity information in our council uh, to see, and now we can use that to track change over time. Um, so the detection of these areas with high biodiversity values and detection of threatened species as well and help us to um, improve land management actions and allocate resources as well. Um, so all of our detections are uploaded into the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas, which is the main tool that the state government used to see patterns in biodiversity and determine the priority areas to conservation uh, and also to allocate money. Um, and I also want to highlight that uh, collecting this type of data specifically, it's, it's, it's amazing, as you can always revisit, you can always reanalyze, you can always reuse. Uh, so this, this was how we framed our analysis so far, but we can always change that. Uh, and we, you know, I feel like we are going to um, change things uh, as we have new tools, new softwares, new, new things being developed all the time. Um, and finally, it is really, really import important uh, to have this incredible community to support our activities. As Karen was saying, like we always have a lot of support for our projects uh, from the landowners uh, that always uh, allow us to uh, to go into the into, into the properties um, and uh, to everyone that helped the project um, through the years. Uh, so in the last months, we had workshops. Uh, focusing on using motion sense cameras for fauna monitoring, uh, and but also in how to how to record and analyze audio data, and those will be uh, offered uh, every year now. Um, and we also continue to use our online platforms, so uh, so Zooniverse for to um, to to analyze our, uh, our data from our cameras and the Arbmon here and at the bottom to to analyze our audio recordings. Those are uh, those are everything. It's online. It's free. Everyone can have access to to all the information um, that 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 they're collecting um, in the project. And finally, if you just if you don't want to if you don't want to to to, to work but just want to um, to relax, just want to chill, to listen and chill. Like we also have this option. So we are making some playlists of, of our recordings available on Spotify now. Uh, I'm going to send the link to everything uh, in an email um, after to, to everyone that was registered here. Uh, but you can also find all everything uh, on our website, hopefully. Um, I think that was it. Thank you. I'm going to...
I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see everyone. And we have some time for, for questions. Oops. There you go. Do we have any questions, comments, anything? Uh, so can I ask, have you found anything surprising? Oh, <laughs> surprising. That's, uh, oh, that's, a, that's, that's a tricky one. Um, Maybe unexpected species, perhaps is a better way to phrase it. Um, I would say nothing unexpected. Um, no, I, 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 I wouldn't say. Um, no, I didn't. Not, nothing out of ordinary. Nothing too. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Too special. <laughs> I think it was some of the interesting thing was uh, seeing brush-tailed fast scales right in Hurstbridge. I think that was pretty cool. I uh, didn't necessarily yeah. expect them to be quite so close to uh, developing. Yeah, this, this, in, in this year, like we still, uh, this data was still, uh, was, was not in the presentation, but um, we did found, found the Fesco Gales again, like in some very weird places, like in some <laughs> very degraded areas, in places where like, wow, what are they doing there? Uh, and we will, was this was also the first year where we got a lot of fesco gales in some areas up in King Lake where we had never seen them before. Uh, so I think well, it's it's not an, it's not a, an expected species, but um, but seeing them like in different places, I think that's um, that's part of uh, the yeah the excitement of the project. Yeah, I think there was one of uh, example two of a uh, image that had both a feral cat and a lyre bird in the same image as well which was in king lake and that was sort of interesting and not so great at the same time but yeah it's it's kind of uh fun to to review the camera images because you the things that you don't normally see and you don't know where they are and i think that's part of the it's sort of like christmas morning and you're like yay you get to look at all the camera images um, oh wow yeah. Um, there was a question about frog life. Um, not explicitly in this project. Um, there have been projects focused on frogs within Nilambic Shire, but they're mostly focused on the specific species. And so mm -hmm. if we were monitoring frog life, we would target areas that are more likely to have frogs. So most of the sites that we go to are within dry or you know not wet areas. Um, and so we're not picking up frogs on them explicitly, but if we wanted to include frogs in that, we'd have to survey different areas. But there have been acoustic projects looking for frogs in Nilambic before. Anyone else? The different Ah, uh, so someone, oops. The you release of rescued wildlife get tracked? Um, not spec not specifically by by this project. Um, no, not specifically by us. Um. No, and the the other question is how useful is the data on invasive species? Oh, that's that's a good one. Um, yeah, we've been we've been we've been talking about this, uh, especially uh, around deers, because um, our because we are using for 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 the invasive species we are using uh, data from our cameras. Um, but it's clearly not the best method to capture uh, deers in the project. So. We are actually not having a lot of detections of deers um, from our cameras, and, and that's why I think for so for deers, I would say uh, it's not reliable. Like uh, we, we get really just a few detections, and we know deers are there everywhere. Um, but when we but 
uh, for foxes uh, and foxes, rabbits, and even cats, like I think is a bit more reliable. Um, we know they are everywhere. Uh, they're probably everywhere, uh, but just not not detecting them in the cameras or detecting too many of them in the cameras does give us an, an idea of uh, where we have more um, invasive species than. And all that data goes to the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas, so DICA can decide whether or not they want to, you know, focus efforts based on those data. I mean, one of the reasons why we don't detect deer on the cameras is they're not set up to detect large animals. They're detected the mid, they're so mid to small animals. And so if you were looking for deer on the cameras, you'd actually have a totally different setup. Um, so yeah, so that's one of the reasons why we can't. But there's certainly a lot of people who are studying deer separate from this project. Yep. All right. Well, we don't have any more questions. I've just um, we're gonna wrap up today. Um, I just want want again to thank Karen for uh, for presenting on us today, uh, and thanks everyone who's been watching. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna send a link to the recording as soon as we have this. I'm gonna send a link to the recording um, to to everyone so you can see again or <laughs> share with uh, with your contacts uh, that's it thank you very much and have a good night thanks everyone thank thanks thanks uh, karen and uh, ellie thanks Oh, I will send the links to all the websites and everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you.